Okay, well, yeah. <laughs> I'm recording all this time. Well, hello and welcome to our um, Rural Youth Project Ideas Cafe. And this is going to be on titled Hope for the Future of Housing. Um, we've got a really kind of rich and varied discussion coming up with four amazing voices um, on very different kind of perspectives on housing. Um, it's been a hell of a year for a lot of people and we have had so many young people, conversations with young people who've been who are feeling fairly disaffected and disengaged with the housing conversation and kind of a bit gloomy and help, hopeless about what opportunities are out there to for change. So um, we've gathered together a panel of people who are doing lots of inspiring things and um so often we've we've we have found that kind of mainstream media doesn't necessarily re represent what's going on out there and so the kind of aim of this conversation and event is to bring forward some of those amazing things that are happening behind the scenes and also to introduce some of the organizations that are so keen to listen to young people and their needs um and to kind of really are so committed to changing the situation so we're hoping to have an inspiring conversation um, and come away with some ideas of what we could do practically ourselves and how we can kind of shift mindsets in, in order to approach this a bit differently because it's very clear that currently the trajectory we're on is not working um, for so many people. Um, just a bit of background, I'm Ellie Strom for, from the Europe Rural Youth Project um, and we kind of, everything that the Rural Youth Project's been doing um, since it started in 2018 has been looking into the barriers that prevent young people from returning or moving to rural areas that they love and um, and consistently the results are coming back, the, the research finds that the main barriers are connectivity, transport and housing and housing has been the biggest, stickiest um, of those topics to kind of bring, bring up because it's so multifaceted and um, and you know, it's meaty and so we're hoping to, that this year is going to be our year of, of really opening up those conversations because it feels more important than ever. Um, so we're going to kick it off with this event and through the rest of the month we're going to be sharing as many kind of stories and information so that we can kind of all improve our understanding of this situation and make sure that we can be doing the best we can to change it um, and support young people to, to seek appropriate housing. Um, I'm going to hand over to our wonderful chair, Amber, for the rest of the evening, but just um, as a little, um, I'm sure everybody here is aware, but just housekeeping that um, please could you turn your mics off in, um, so that we can make sure that we hear the different speakers. Um, but Amber is amazing. She's been working with us for the last year and a half to set up the Rural Youth Project Smart Village, um, which is our latest site. So check it out if you haven't haven't already. Um, and um, Amber is a pro kayaker who's been off to the World Cup recently and is going off to the British Championships. to a lady, lady of many talents um, and runs her own, um, or with, with Oscar, your partner, run your own business um, up in, <laughs> in Perthshire. And um, so I'm going to hand over to you and you can do a cracking job of chairing the evening. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for coming. It's really cool to know that there's specialists in the area, especially from a wide range of areas, coming to talk about housing, because as young people in rural Scotland, it can feel really easily like there's not that many people to speak to uh, about it. Um, so I'll talk a bit about my perspective and kind of introduce myself and like where I come from. Um, so I'm not 30 yet, and we moved back to Aberfeldy, which is my hometown in rural Perthshire and sort of my hometown. Um, and the main problem we found was finding somewhere to rent long-term. Um, so originally we moved into a tiny house, which was not appropriate for long-term rent, but we had insecurities around our landlords. And I know a lot of young people in the same position around where I live. Um, so there's a lot of people coming into these areas and either totally unable to find, um, sorry, I'm just expanding you so I can see all of you. Hi. And <laughs> um, yeah, it's it, it feels impossible to find somewhere to safely long term rent, especially when just now it's it feels so hard to compete with Airbnb where you can rent something for nine hundred pounds a week rather than long term rent something for that amount a month. And um, so it is really cool to see so many panelists here to kind of talk about the a different way of thinking around that. Um, so there's loads of new houses being built in these areas and um, a lot of them are affordable and look like for a first time buyer with a government scheme that'd be possible for people like me and my partner who have just started a business and 
are looking at joining the housing ladder as it were but they're just all of them have planning permission that say they can't be primary re primary residences um so i think kind of where i want to come from as chair is like what is the different angles we can look at with that um and how do we persuade people that renting long term and also making properties that are affordable more available possible for young people because at the end of the day um when we're talking about housing it isn't just about housing it's about bringing kind of young skill sets and new ideas to rural communities because i think without young people coming in the populations and industries in these areas are definitely going to suffer so it'd be really cool if everyone can tell us what we think about that um but i'd like to introduce some of our panelists um so derek works for rural housing scotland and if you'd like to say hi <laughs> Uh, yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, I, I'm from Perthshire as well, actually, funny enough. Um, I grew up in in a village called Errol, which is kind of about uh, 10 miles outside Perth. Um, and I think that experience actually is, is sort of has, has been the reason I've followed this career because, um, you know, way back, way back when I was young, um, young people were finding it difficult to find it somewhere to live as well. I think it's a lot worse now, but back then it seemed it seemed hard. All the council housing was getting sold off through the right to buy. You know, people couldn't find anywhere to live. Um, you know, council housing in rural areas was scarce anyway, and it was getting scarcer. But now, you know, the, the private rent sector has been hollowed out. Um, you know, the housing associations don't really build that much in rural Scotland. Um, they build where it's easiest to build, and building rural housing is quite difficult and quite hard. So, but I'll go into that in more detail later on. Sure. And then we've also got Anya, um, who represents young people for all sorts of things across Highland Scotland, um, but speaks for us when we're thinking about things like housing. Yeah, uh, so I'm Anya. I am the Highland Youth Convener. Um, so that's that's something that's quite unique in the Highlands. Um, so my role sort of is, is a, is a full-time role as, as, as a voice for young people. Um, so any topics that are coming up that affect young people, I can bring that forward on a higher platform, um, such as the council. Um, I come from the, the very north coast of Scotland, from a small town called Thurzo. Um, and rural housing is is a big issue um you know we talk about things like you know like was just mentioned about how in some rural areas it's um building is happening you know trying to find trying, trying to pull these young people back into the area but actually where i am that's that's not that's not what ha what is happening um, and the popularity of the north coast 500 means that a lot of the the housing that is available is starting to become holiday homes or or you know second homes for um, families from from further away so that creates a big problem when it comes to young people looking at at moving out and um, young people looking at returning to the area and um, but obviously there's that bigger conversation about how do we pull young people back to the area it's not just housing that's the problem you've got to think about jobs and and what is actually there to to attract these young people Thanks, Anya. I, I wonder if it's similar to where I am um, in the mostly hospitality seems to be suffering with staff shortages and things. And then housing feels like I don't know if it's a symptom or an effect, uh, but definitely it's all combined into loads of different industries. And um, then we've also got Will, who is coming to us from Exmoor Young Voices. And I think Will is also the founding the founder, the chief founder of X My Young Voice. Sounds like you're not, doing some really exciting stuff. <laughs> not quite, but nearly. Um, I am Will, um, I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to speak to you from Exmoor and, and share our experiences of Exmoor Young Voices and what we've done over the years. Um, I myself am, uh, am very much fit in the category of what you guys have all been speaking about. Um, I'm 31, living at home, and the youngest person in the village by a generation. Um, it's a sad state of affairs, but it, it is what it is. Um, the reason I'm here is, is really is the 
Exmoor Young Voices Group was set up and I've become chair of was um, the National Park asked our senior advisor, Les Silver, why are so many young people leaving Exmoor? Um, what, what are their issues and what are their problems? And from there, he decided to create a survey and um, the survey pulled out many fantastic results, um, basically highlighting everything you guys have been talking about, similar issues with yourselves, um, transport, infrastructure, um, which is your connectivity, your mobiles, your lack of internet and so on, um, and, and finally housing. And um, there were many key issues brought up around housing, um, the affordability, the size of the properties and the suitability of the properties. Um, a number of the properties that are here, the, the affordable houses aren't suitable for rural working. Um, for argument's sake, they don't consider that rural workers need room for their tools, their dogs, their animals, um, even just somewhere to take your wellies off. Um, so they're not suitable for the area that they're in. And that's that's a deep problem. Um, we're in an area where like one in five homes are empty or second homes. So as much as as much as we do need to um, consider building, because I think there was a statistic come up the other day of there's so few houses built on Exmoor, it was it was double figures, but only just over the last something like 30 years. Um, which is, is brilliant in terms of keeping the Exmoor landscape as it is and has been for years, but doesn't help young people be able to stay here and so on. Um, it was sort of found out that we've got some of the highest house prices and some of the lowest incomes in the country, um, which as a mix uh, deemed us to be the most socially deprived area in the whole of the country, which um, is, is a sad state of affairs when you, when you think of it like that. But it's the resilient ones and the ones that are still here are, um, are the most in, uh, and trying to encourage ones to come back is, is probably the most important way and I think hopefully we can talk later on about some of the solutions as to how we've tried to overcome some of the issues we've had. Thanks Will that'd be amazing to talk about later on and um, it's sort of reassuring to know the problem's kind of universal across the country i think if you filled all the holiday homes in Aberfell, the population would triple we'd need yeah, a <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah. finally our last panelist is rosemary um coming to us from building workshop and she's going to talk to us about design mindset is that right yeah, nice to see you all. I'm Rosemary Scrimger and I have an architecture practice building workshop together with my husband Ben in Lintrathen, which is in a rural part of Angus. So uh, Ben worked with Norman Foster in London in, on skyscrapers and super yachts before we started our practice. And I studied interpreting and translating and lived and worked in various countries around the world before moving back to rural Angus where I grew up. So at Building Workshop, we work with rural people, farmers, house owners, and all sorts of rural businesses to transform their spaces and places, often bringing abandoned old buildings back into meaningful use. This summer, I've also been particularly into rural architecture because I was asked to guest edit the summer edition of the, our professional body, the Royal Incorporation of Architects in Scotland Summer Journal, which was on rural architecture. So I can pop a link to that in the comments after. And as well as Rural architecture, I have a remote, co um, a remote contract with Stanford Graduate School of Business in California, where I coach business leaders from all over the world, from big business, big tech, like Apple, Google, and so on, as well as all sorts of nonprofits, healthcare organizations, and small business owners in corporate innovation, and in particular, customer experience design and storytelling for impact. So my studies and continued learning at Stanford have really opened my eyes to the possibilities that a well-informed and creative design process can unearth. When so many people think about design, we think of things that look really cool, but design is not just about the looks. First of all, it's about how things work. What are they trying to solve? The whys, the hows, the for whose, and is this really the best way to do it? Design is all about choice and expanding the options available before picking and pursuing the best one. And I think that here we have a really big design challenge. And I look forward to hopefully working with some of you in the months ahead to try and apply design to the challenge of rural housing for young people in Scotland. In terms of my experience of rural housing, as well as working with our clients on projects, I also have personal experience. 10 years ago, my husband and I 
were living in a cold, damp, miserable co rented cottage in rural Angus, where our cooker was from the 1980s and needed a vice grip to open. Um, we applied for planning permission to build ourselves a home and office for our very newly started practice, which was refused by our local authority. And during the appeal process, we were so disillusioned by the lack of support for young people. We were the only people under 60 that were hoping to set up and have a home in this rural area. And yet there was no support. We agreed that if our application was refused at appeal, we would move to Paraguay. And we really would have done, we were, we, we'd had it. Um, but we didn't, we soldiered on in our architecturally miserable cottage where life was fun, but um, it was definitely challenging. Um, a low point was two burstier drums during a particularly cold winter. Um, and at the time that we moved into our house six years ago, we had our architecture office in the biggest bedroom in our three bedroom cottage, our two small children in the smallest bedroom and Ben and I shared a room with our deep freeze, which was quite noisy. Um, so here we are now living and working in rural Angus, bringing up our children, running our architecture practice. And um, yeah, I'm excited to be part of the conversation about rural housing because we need young people. We need diversity in the countryside. And it's just so hard for young people just now to be here. And um, yeah, so as a start to this session today, I would like to propose a quick design um, little activity because we're at a point just now where this is the situation and first of all we can consider a disaster storm what are all the things that could go wrong and are going wrong and how bleak could it get so first of all let's write in the chat everyone you know think of all of the things that are concerning you and are a disaster and all the bad things about young people and rural housing just now. And then we will move into a happier place of all the wonderful possibilities. So let's take, just take a moment to share our biggest concerns, bugbears, frustrations, headaches, rants. Because I think what we'll probably see is there are some common themes and then there'll be some specific ones in certain areas. Rural labour, no affordable housing, too many second homes, holiday homes, lack of support for startups. I would add to that ageing population, even if you are a young person in a rural area with a home, you're probably in the minority. Yeah, for sure simply not being able to move out. Young people leave or don't return because of the simple basics, there are no homes. So how could this end up? What are the disasters? Just no rural people, no young people. Closed schools, empty town halls, nobody to serve the people who live in the holiday houses. Yeah, nobody to provide services. hospitality venues struggling to stay open, no children, older people. A sorry situation. And now let's quickly move into a more happy future. What would we like to see? What would be the dream situation here? If we could click our fingers and see a positive future for young people in a rural housing scenario. community affordable housing, shared resources, helping young people to build their own homes, opportunities to buy land and build for young people, smart clackens, thriving rural communities and businesses, rural workers and home hubs, street food cafes, workshops, life, shared working spaces and stronger communities where young people have a say. Enabling planners, community connections, sports clubs. So what, where we are just now is that 
at this point in time, either of these two outcomes is a possibility. We could either end up in a sad disaster state or in a super positive, happy place. And so, um, yeah, here we are. And let's, what we need to do is, is properly understand the problem, the challenges, who's in the way, who can enable change in the right direction, who are the people that need to be brought on side and then make a plan um, over and out for now. Thanks so much, Rosemary. Um, it is really cool to go from sort of the doom and gloom because it is so easy to go down that rabbit hole. Um, and it's amazing what you overcame to be in your situation now. So as a as a young person in a rural place, I find that really inspiring. <laughs> um, with a deep freeze. That's hard. <laughs> it was surprisingly noisy. Yeah, I, well, I don't even like sharing a room with the fridge and our fridge <laughs> is like half a metre square. <laughs> um, so if everyone's okay with it, I have some questions um, that I'd like to address to all of you and some questions I'd like to address more specifically um, to each of you. Um, so what I'd like to start with, um, and I'm sure because we all come from such different places, um, everyone would have a really different way of answering this that would bring more light kind of to the different industries that we specialise in. Um, but we've already kind of gone over a little bit with Rosemary what we see as the most crucial issues with rural housing, but I wonder if it would be worth just briefly brushing over in our specific industries. Um, so obviously for Scotland, but also like places like Exmoor as well, like other rural communities, what what is the key issue um, with rural housing in our respective areas? Um, anyone can start. <laughs> can I start? Yeah, of course. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Um, to, to me, it's just there's little affordable housing being built for for young people, um, for anybody in rural areas. Um, and some of the government investment doesn't reach rural Scotland as much as it should do. So we get we are 17 percent of the population in rural areas and we get something like 11, 12% of housing investment um, into affordable housing. And part of that is because we don't count young people who are stuck at home, living at home, we don't count them as being in housing need. So we don't, we don't target investment um, to meet their needs. Um, they only become in housing need when they get fed up living at home and, have to, and, and, and leave the area. I mean, in an urban area, people you get fed up living at home, go and find a flat to live in, 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 the, in the town or the city. In a rural perspective, if they get fed up living at home or can't live at home anymore, then they have to leave, mostly. Um, yeah. And so that, that means that, you know, that, can, that kind of housing need that, you know, that, that exists within rural, communities doesn't get recognized it doesn't get acted upon and you know we 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 consistently year after year get lack get little investment so part of what we try and do is try and um talk to government about the, the housing needs that we know exist within rural Scotland and particularly those of young people who are leaving in their in because they have no alternative. Um, there was research done maybe a few years ago now, it talked about the young and stuck. It talked about people who were over age of 26, who were living at home with their with their parents, or who were in who were couples who were living at home with their with one one set of parents. And in and in rural areas, in particular, particularly remote rural areas, that was up to about 50% of young people in that kind of situation. And those were exactly the same areas that are suffering from depopulation, exactly the same areas where we need young people to stay. So if we're serious actually about doing something about depopulation and sustaining rural communities, we need to invest in housing in those areas. Yeah. And we need to invest in the delivery of um, co-working space and community hubs and other things 
which actually enable people to live and work in a rural community. One of the benefits of the pandemic, if there are any benefits and silver linings, is that people have realised that, that you, you don't have to live in Edinburgh and Glasgow to work for international companies. There's Rosemary and Angus working in Stanford in the States. And, you know, we can probably all point to people who, who work all over the world doing different things. So you could be local, national and international working from an office in the South, in South Euston or in Angus or wherever. So yeah. I, think, you know, I think that has really, that's a real opportunity that we need to grasp um, going forward. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to jump in just so we don't run out of time yeah. for all the other panellists. But I think what you said about people starting to see that living in a rural area doesn't mean it has to be the end of your career and it doesn't mean you have to be moving away from opportunities. Um, I'd, um, I'd like to ask Anya what you have heard from other young people as being the most critical issues and also sort of who, who you'd go about talking to in terms of addressing them? I think in terms of issues, so obviously the conversation is around housing, but you've got to look much wider. So, you know, what are the job prospects of a young person within a rural community? Um, because if the job prospects aren't there, then you're not going to retain a young person there. Um, you know, you need, they, need to, they need to be working to build that income to be able to then go out and enter the rental market or to be able to go and afford to, to buy a house. So that's that's right down where it starts is actually what is available for young people. Um, young people don't know where to turn to. You know, this is this is new for us. You know, there's no sort of education around this is where you go to find a property. This is where you go to find ask somewhere to rent. Um, we our, our go to place is social media to, to go and look for these things. And it's often not there. Um, or what is there is completely out with our budgets or it is not within an area that that we want to be or as you say it means you know up in and leaving out of your comfort zone away from your support networks and your family and moving to a city which for your rural young people can be a really big sort of daunting task they go from these sort of really pocket you know pockets of rurality and and knowing everybody to suddenly be in a, a, a very sort of small fish in a big ocean in a city um with, with my role, so young people come to me and we raise that on a, on a wider scale. Um, so typically that means going to the council, raising a paper with the council, but that's not something that's easily done or, or you know, you could bring a paper to council and it can quite easily be, you know, sort of thrown out and dismissed. Um, but I think with these conversations, it's about actually coming down to a young person's level and speaking to young people. So often these conversations happen and it's, it's an adult speaking on a young, young person's behalf. Whereas actually we should be, you know, getting down and actually speaking with even 16, 15, 16 year olds and finding out what is your next steps in life? Where are you going to go? You know, how, how are you going to do this? And, and how can I help you along that, that path and that journey to make sure that you understand where to go next? And I wonder how much of it is actually bringing it into a smaller sphere of thinking as well, because just like you said, there's no social media support. We now have the Smart Village digital platform for everyone to look at in terms of job opportunities. Um, but I have wondered kind of how do you persuade people that it's better to rent long term than a holiday let, which obviously makes you more money. But is it mostly business owners in areas that own properties to rent? Because I know a huge amount here that do, it's like local business owners who can surely see the benefit of bringing a younger population into work for them potentially and have a long-term career that way. So I wonder how many times it's actually about marketing and figuring out how to best change people's perspective on not the way they can immediately make the most money, but the way they can grow their own community and keep it current. Um, but I was gonna ask, uh, Will, um, from your experience, how can community action lead to change? Because I think you've done something quite exciting in Exmoor. Yeah, we've been very lucky. Um, from all of our surveys and all of our information, um, and from our initial survey, we met with a group called the Consultative Forum, which is a group that is led by the National Park of all vested interests. And from there, we were lucky enough to... Um, go and speak within the House of Lords and House of Parliament on, on rural housing issues and try and highlight what the issues were for ex-more youngsters and, and what, what the issues were to, to 
lords and peers and, and the likes to try and say, look, here, here are the issues. Um, since then, we've been invited via other groups, including um, CPRE and, and the RICB about um, and to talk about our issues. And some of the ways we've overcome some of the things that we've had is um, we're very lucky on a local scale is that we created a summit meeting um, with our with National Park, which are our planning authority. Um, as we're a cross-border area, so we have Devon and Somerset as part of Exmoor National Park. Um, we worked alongside Devon County Councils and Somerset County Council, District Councils and all the local councils, um, all the housing associations. And we managed to get all of these groups in one room, which is the first time they'd ever been in one room together and create this summit meeting, which um, we, we invited five of our youngsters to come and speak to the group about some of their issues, but also turned up with with a list of the issues and said to these all these groups said what can you do to help solve these problems these aren't all problems that can't be solved we have solutions to all of these problems but we need your help to do them and we've basically created a working collaborative approach with with all of these groups to try and um, enable some progress for young people on the more and and hopefully um, this is a model we're hoping we can recreate for other areas and allow other groups to do something similar to what we did. Um, and it's, our, our next summit meeting is what is due in the spring and to, to go further and, and try and push, push some of these groups on some of the pledges that they've made as to what they can and can't do. And also to try and explain how to some of the groups that said, oh, I can't do this. Well, actually, OK, you're, you may not directly be running that but you are you can influence that because they have to work with one another to ensure that things happen so it, it does stand uh, it has worked very well for us and things things that we spoke about in that meeting have actually come to fruition already and and changes have been made to try and help um for instance, sake there's a home finder system around here for affordable housing and the the form for it all was was so wordy and and hard work for any youngster to understand to understand for anyone to understand that only a younger person and they've tried to make it simpler and more sensible and uh, for for young people to fill in and for, for to try and encourage young people to fill in um, there is a illusion that um, the young people couldn't even afford the affordable housing and it was and it takes so long to sort out well now um, there are talking cafes and working groups to try and ensure that there is help to fill in these forms and the like. So it's all progress made from that first meeting. So hopefully the second one and further ones in the future will, will create some kind of positive outlook for all of that side of things. It sounds like actual real change is happening, which is so encouraging to hear because um, it is so easy to feel like kind of you submit your ideas and you kind of apply for the right things but nobody seems to be listening so it's so cool that it is actually happening in other places in the country and I think that might be the kick that quite a lot of young people need um, and it's I kind of want to ask Rosemary um because I, I think we all have a kind of similar dialogue around this definitely as young people in rural areas it feels inaccessible but to me I keep going back to the idea that actually the circles are a lot smaller like I know like it sounds like because obviously Derek and Will and you guys are all experts it sounds like at a governmental level perhaps there's not as much support as there should be so should we be looking at a smaller circle of influence and talking more to immediate people we know what what should change about our thinking <laughs> mm, it's such a big topic um there are so many different things to consider for example um get to as you're doing it's great that you're getting together and having this conversation because one little you know one person on their own with a problem is one thing but when there's a whole group of people that can go to a policymaker and say we're all in this situation we're all experiencing these problems then they might pay more attention also there are so many different possible small solutions to some of the issues for example for some young people a lot of progress could be made with a difficult conversation with the parents um, in some situations, it's about an employer that needs to support employees to be able to do the job that the employer needs the young person to be able to do in that specific place. So I don't think it's a case of one size fits all. 
Um, but I think that one thing that's important is to understand what is the exact issue that each young person is facing and is are there more options available than those that immediately come to mind? Um, I think when it comes to housing, everyone often thinks we need more houses, but sometimes that isn't what we need. We need to get the buildings that exist already to be being used better. You know, we need local authorities and governments to put their money where their mouth is in terms of every local authority is now employing circular economy ambassadors. Okay, well, what about all these empty buildings that aren't being lived in? Why, is, why do tax rules still incentivize new build over restoration or conversion of existing buildings? Um, I think, you know, there are so many different things, mm -hmm. but yeah, whether, you know, in some cases it's a difficult conversation, it'll make all the difference, but in some situations it's policy that gets in the way. Um, you know, what about all the empty churches nowadays? Could they be used? There are a lot of, you know, life has changed since many of these buildings were built that are in rural areas and many, many buildings in rural areas are being underused. And so I would encourage that before, or as well as considering new housing needs, there's also looking at what's there and what can we use better. And, you know, is there another way? Are there more ways? Are there, yeah, it's, I, think, I think a big part of it is about imagination and expanding the possibilities. Yeah. Can I come in a minute? Um, I just, yes, yes. just say one of, one of the things I'd be really interested in finding out is 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 working with you guys just to um, develop new ideas and new options because I think what what we find is a lot of the a lot of the policy that's made for housing is made with a with an urban hat on and it doesn't fit a rural, the rural circumstances. So there used to be a grant you could get to build your own homes in rural Scotland called a Rural Ownership Grant. And it was a really good grant. You got up to 40% of the cost of building um, to build a house. Uh, but they did away with it and they brought in something called Open Market Shared Equity, which was a kind of idea whereby you could get 40% of the cost of buying a house on the open market. Now, lots of in lots of rural areas, there's not that many houses come on the open market. Um, you know, some islands, there might be one or two a year, and the ones that do come on, on, on the market are really, really expensive. So we need something that's rural, that's targeted at a rural perspective, rather than something that's just a, an urban with a, with, you know, yeah. So, um, so that, that's what we need to do. I mean, we need to look at, look at new ideas like mutual ownership co-ops and collective self-build and all those kind of ideas, things that might help young people to, to work together to deliver housing and you know home ownership courts for example you don't need a mortgage you don't need, need a deposit but through the co-op you you acquire shares in a in your home and if you leave and you want to leave you can leave with a with a, a deposit for for another house somewhere else so there's new ideas and new models out there and we just need um we need the energy of young people mixed with some of the cynicism and experience of, of folk of my age and um, we can maybe get somewhere hopefully we can for sure i like that's so encouraging to hear like the initiatives like this are being thought about and um, especially the idea of kind of being in a housing situation where you're not just blowing money on rent where you might actually be investing in something that could pay a deposit in the future when you're ready to have your own place um, and yeah. I do not feel like an hour is long enough to cover <laughs> all the issues around this. I feel like like every, it keeps coming back to the same thing, which at the end of the day seems to be adding value back into the communities in which you work, um, which is super inspiring because it does feel like the way things are going just now, that as hospitality is suffering because of staff shortage, because of housing, because of lack of access for young people, perhaps it is being pushed in that direction anyway. Um, but all of these ideas are awesome. And I think it's definitely something to run with after an ideas cafe. But I'll hand over to Ellie. 
Gosh, yeah, it seems to have gone incredibly quickly. But um, I just didn't want to let Derek go before he talked about smart clackens, which is like such an exciting bit of news for Rural Housing Scotland this week that's kind of, kind of come out. So you highlighted a lot of the challenges and the kind of ide ideas and initiatives that could come. But please tell us about your initiative that's actually happening. and You've got full funding and things and it's taking off. Yeah, I mean, we, we've we've been funded by Esme Fairbairn to take forward a project that we we started developing really as a bit of response to two things. One was there was a research from the James Hunt, Hutton Institute which demonstrated that rural areas were you know there was a real exodus of young people from a lot of sparsely populated sparsely populated areas because because of housing. And there was also a, a bunch of young people in 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 Uist and North Uist got together and made a noise about this, made a noise about the fact that they couldn't um, find anywhere to live. They were looking for a different way of doing housing in Uist. They couldn't compete with people who were coming in um, to, to, to buy housing there. And that that's kind of just got worse over the pandemic. People are kind of escaping to the countryside, um, you know, to, and but what, what the young people there wanted, they wanted to stay but they wanted somewhere of their own they wanted space to 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 grow to expand to um to to live and to work and to um be more connected to the land as well to maybe grow their own vegetables and have a more sustainable lifestyle um so from that and from the 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 work we've done about on co-housing and looking at mutual ownership co-ops we came up with this idea of a kind of reinvention of the clacken. So we call it a smart clacken. We've probably nicked that from you guys as Smart Village. Anyway, um, but um, and really it's just a, 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 an idea whereby it will be, we will develop maybe six to eight houses in a, in a location. Um, they will have communal workspace, but they will have communal areas for things like laundry and for power and for renewables and, and for things like e-cars and, and recharging um, things. So, and, and they're kind of trying to demonstrate that rural life is not unsustainable, um, both in terms of being able, young people being able to stay, but also, you know, it can be net zero carbon, like zero carbon life, because you can, you can develop your energy close by, you can, um, grow your food close by and in some respects is a more sustainable place to live than than towns and cities so so watch the space we're working with Storis Uist um, who have put forward three sites for development of of a smart clack on each and they will be appointing someone um, well we'll be advertising in, in 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 the next month or so for someone a project manager a young person hopefully um, to take forward the project in in Uist and but we're also looking to do this on Tyree and also in North Ronaldsey as well so um so yeah we hope we're hoping it's uh it become a new way of 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 um providing opportunities because a lot of the time you know it's the same old same old it's a you know a housing association builds a scheme of houses um on in on the outskirts of Stornoway um and that doesn't help a young person on South Uist, you know, um, who doesn't want to live in a in a scheme on the outskirts of Stornoway or move there. They want mm. they want to live in a in a in a in a house in in their community with a with, with a bit of land that they can use to grow a business and 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 grow their own their own you know their food and etc. So mm. and still with the community. So that's that's where that's what smart talking <laughs> about. Yeah, thank you I so much. Building, please. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's very attractive, isn't it? Um, I think it's just brilliant. It's like hearing always kind of Rosemary's design thinking approach kind of meeting up with what you guys are already doing. And I think it kind of it what this conversation brings forward is the fact that it's a, it's a 
it's a mindset change and actually if there can be more kind of pilot projects like this to yeah. show what can be done differently yeah. um you know that's like what will's working on in a local a, a sort of a small set of six families in in exmoor and and it's just like if we can have more and more examples of this um mm. yeah I'll, i won't talk for too long but one of the things that i really just kept picking out from what everyone was saying was just this collaboration thing of how there are so many we're all these little um you know siloed projects that are working on kind of different angles of this and actually we'll all we all benefit from getting in the same room as somebody said like and and actually kind of sharing information and knowledge and insights um and this real need to listen more to what actually young people need and want um i just wanted to just throw to our oh, sorry Jane you've got a question but I just I wanted to throw to Will because I know you've done a lot of really specific very tailored research into what the needs are of young people in Exmoor and I just wondered if you if you could share some of the kind of quite specific insights because I just found it so fascinating that we don't know necessarily what rural young people need and want and um just shows how important it is to ask those questions sorry over to you Will. <laughs> sorry damn technology um to be fair the, the tailored results come back pretty much as that um again they're going over it again from transport and the lack of it around here and, and trying to work on ways to ensure that young people have a way to, to um maintain jobs and work around here um, improving the infrastructure in terms of um, the ability to work from home. Um, currently, um, the internet in my own house is 1.1 megabytes per second, which is horrific. Um, but I can pinch the village hall's Wi-Fi on a good day when the weather's all right-ish, because then I can use a fiber, a peer-to-peer mass thing. Um, it's, it's rolling out these just things as simple as broadband and mobile to these rural areas like ourselves where where we don't have them and, and encouraging young people to uh, and working people to be able to stay at home and then on the housing side of things it's, it's really making sure that the places are, are affordable um, and as affordable as possible uh, in many ways um, the size and the suitability of everything just and working with um, the groups that we have, the key thing we've done so far is work with the national park, work with the councils, work with all the local groups to ensure that they know what our young people's issues are and what they can do about things, how they can change things. And change isn't always fast. And sometimes they don't understand what you're saying first time, second time, tenth time. But if you keep banging on the door, eventually people will, it will, it will resonate with people and they will understand what, what the issues are. And um, there's been countless times where I've been in the meeting and I've been the youngest one in the room by 20, 30, 40 years. And, but in the end, they do come round to understanding that to enable young people on to stay on Exmoor, there has to be flexibility and things do have to change. And, and we've been working with all these groups to ensure that does happen. I think that's why groups like ours and even yourselves just are, are so vital to ensuring that the people can stay where they're to and, and come back. Absolutely. I just remember you saying to me on the phone that they um, that it, some of your research showed that it was even down to just having a porch for muddy boots and understanding the needs of people that have rural jobs that are working outdoors and having a place for their dogs to be, um, you know, that that is suitable housing in a rural context and it's kind of vital for people's work and things. Um, right. Thank you so much for sharing. The breakdown and the logistics of it all becomes tighter and tighter as for the area you're in and so on, and, and that changes all the time. Um, we, we're limited to what is considered 93 square metres for an affordable home. Mm. Uh, because of the work we've done with the National Park, they've now actually changed the boundaries on that to enable, um, to now in the future, now enable for porches to be added on, what, um, offices, um mm. and workspace a fourth bedroom if need be for an extra family member um there are there are remits as to why you can have a bigger house than that but um it's it's shown some kind of flexibilities on national parks working as to what as to the needs of not only young people but working people on the moor and that might yeah. 
initially be on a self-built basis, but in the future, hopefully that will also enable the housing associations to do similar and make make it far easier for, for young people to stay in a suitable house where they're too. Yeah, thank you so much, Will. That's great. Jane, um, your question. Thanks, Els. No, it wasn't the question. It was more really, you know, our, uh, I suppose our commitment and, you know, what, what I think this conversation has been brilliant this evening, pulling together people that just have great ideas and, and a real sense of can do. Um, and it was really just to say last week we met Marie Goujon and launched our manifesto and housing is covered within that. And then tomorrow, Derek, you're probably joining me on on presenting at the select committee. Uh, for rural affairs, um, islands and the natural economy. Um, and we're giving evidence to help influence the next parliamentary session. And so Derek's going to be talking about housing and I'm gonna be talking about rural young people. And then also Rebecca and I met, as I mentioned earlier, but I think Rosemary, you weren't on the call then. We met Marie Goujon, the cab cabinet secretary for um, rural and islands last Thursday. And her ears really pricked up when I said we were going to be doing this design thinking research into rural housing for young people. So it was really an ask for everybody on this call. Um, it would be great to have your involvement to work with Rosemary. She gave you a, a small taster of what design thinking can look like and the reimagining. Um, but we have got a really good opportunity to do something here and to get some funding to get this research done. So. It was really just to say, if, if you're all up for it, we'd love your help in, in getting, getting this research done. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. And we'll be staying in touch. And also that's just to, um, to kind of reiterate to everybody watching this on a recording as well, that, um, that we'll put up resources on the, um, on the Smart Village, web, the Rural Youth Project Smart Village website for, and anybody that is a panelist today will be contributing um, what they've been working on. So that's a great place to head to um, catch up with them if you also want to follow up. Um, I just wanted to share, because we've had quite a few questions through, but just um, if everybody is okay to just run a couple of minutes over because we, um, we started a bit later, but just we've got a question about just what would everyone's top tip for a young person be um, to change this housing situation, whether it's as an individual or a collective? Um, so does anybody could fire off perhaps actually we could start with Anya who's had most contact with like young people directly what would your top tip for a young person be raise your voice um because unless you are raising your voice and making a noise about it change is not going to happen um so whether well it's better to do that as a collective a stronger voice is, is a collective voice so you know get together and, and make a noise about it thank you such a good point and it keeps coming up doesn't it just having that confidence to go for it but um, Rosemary what would you say? I would add to that to think of some small solutions that would make things better and ask for help because if you have a solution and all you need for, for somebody to do is to say yes then ask you'll be surprised how often people do want to help it's just they maybe don't know the answer so if you have something that they could do that would make things better for you then try. Thank you very much. Will, what about you? I would have said in our experience, we found so far is trying to work collaborative, collaboratively with the other groups and, and the other people vested in, in young people. Um, try and work with them. We found in the past there have been groups that have worked against the parks and the likes and turned around and shouted out what their problems are, but haven't always tried to say, here's a problem, here's a solution. Um, working on not only highlighting your problem, but if you can work on possible solutions, you won't always work, but more often than not, that they'll see that you're working as well and, and try and work with you. Mm, it's that thing of finding your tribe, it kind of comes back to you, doesn't it? To have more clout together, don't you? Thank yeah, you very much. Uh, um, and Derek, finally. Yeah, well, um... I would I would echo what they're saying about you know um, make yourself heard, but and also to to ask for help. Um, and two very specific things. One is get yourself on on sign up on the on the housing waiting list with the council. You may you might not want a 
a council house um, or anything, but if you're in housing need, sign up. Sign up for where you want to have a house, not where they tell you houses are available. So, because it's only by that that we actually will get investment where it's needed most. Because if we keep getting fobbed off as saying, oh, we'll never get a house there, don't you don't ask for a house there, then nobody thinks we need to put investment there. And if you've mm -hmm. got an idea, come and talk to us. We're really happy to help. Um, there's some really inspirational ideas out there, things that no, not enough other people know, know that. I mean, just along from you know, Spitalfield in Perthshire, you know, for 20 years ago, 30 years ago, there was a group of young people all got together and all built their houses together. Now, they did that 20 years ago, 30 years ago, they could do that today. Um, there's a rural housing fund, which is underspent. It needs young people to come forward with good ideas and help, and we can help them develop these ideas and spend some of that money, um, mm. which will help to get affordable housing built in rural areas. Thank you. It's so useful to have those kind of practical tips as well, because I think, I mean, I've been completely baffled by where to begin with helping myself, let alone like the rest of the community sometimes. And so actually just picking up from some of the things that Anya was saying and um, Will, like the need for a resource for young people and, and better education around like where to begin. I think people have felt at such a loss. So even that, that's just such a really practical tip. Will, you've got something to add before we close. Yes. Sorry for running over. <laughs> no, no, no. All I was to say is just to add to what Derek said really is, um, it's one thing we found is key to, to moving forward around here is that um, registering on your, your local equivalent to the council home finder system is, is very important. Mm -hmm. um, even if you don't think it's viable for you to have a council home, whatever, if they don't know that there's a need for you to have a home, they won't ever consider building or, or doing anything for your area. So as much as it may not be affordable for you to have an affordable house or it might not even be practical for you to have an affordable house, if they don't know there's a need for it, they're not going to account for it in the future planning of, of whether that be renovating or, or building new builds. So that mm. is important in, in ensuring that happens. That is such a useful insight, yeah, to understand that demand's there. Amazing. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. This hour has gone so quickly and we kind of anticipated it with four panellists that have so much to say on the subject that we were only ever going to scratch the surface. But it's just to say that the, this is the kind of beginning of a, a wider conversation. I mean, it's high time that we had it and it, you know, we really are noticing that you know we've got a part we hold a part of the puzzle and we want to share our information and we're hopefully going to be doing this amazing research project with uh, with rosemary this year and we want to share those insights so that you know rural housing scotland can go away and use that to their best advantage to make sure that they have the sort of the bigger impact as well so i think yeah it's just about kind of keeping the collaborative partnerships going um and thank you so much for joining us and thank you amber for such an amazing job chairing um it's just so wonderful to have you all here um, and we'll all be sharing this within our networks um, and yes, making noise, raising our voices. So thank you very much. Thanks Jane, so much. go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Amber, did you say something? Oh no, I was just gonna say thanks a lot everyone. Um, as a young person in a rural area, I do feel inspired and like I have something to move forward with, which means mm. I hope that all the other young people watching this do as well. Mm. So. Thank, Thank you. you. Jane, did you want to add something? Close. No, I was just clapping. It was a really, really good hour. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, clapping all around. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at future events. We're going to be posting about the next two that we have coming up in November. So we've got two, one at the start of November and one at the end of November. The first one is on climate change and activism, um, youth activism. And we are going to then have another one on community at the end of the November. So please look out for those and join us for the next ones. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop recording but I'm not going to say goodbye to you quite yet. <laughs>